Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. Today on Versus, we reprise 2x2 time zones, the Grand Seiko Spring Drive GMT SBGE 245 versus the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Explorer 2. Versus starts now. You guys know the Explorer 2 fairly well. We'll return to it, but we're going to lead off with the Challenger and the unknown quantity. This watch is the SBGE 245, a Spring Drive GMT released for 2018 in a limited series of 600 pieces. Now, the watch does feature a rotating GMT style bezel just like the GMT Master, a spring drive movement, and a sensational burgundy metallic sunburst dial. It is a larger watch than the Explorer, at least in terms of thickness and diameter, whereas the Explorer is a 42, this is a 44. Whereas the Explorer is 12.4 millimeters thick, this one is 14.7. But across the wrist, the Grand Seiko makes up lost ground on the ergonomic front, as the Grand Seiko spans 52.7 millimeters end link to end link across the wrist, and the Rolex is a broader 53.3, so on that count, Advantage Grand Seiko. You will note that there are strap tool apertures in the lugs, and you may use them. The spacing 21 millimeters gives this watch one of the broadest stances between its lugs of any Grand Seiko sports watch, so it has a very contemporary and planted appearance on the wrist. And whereas you're never going to take a Rolex off the factory bracelet, you even get those strap tool apertures in the flank of this watch to encourage and enable strap usage, so this is perhaps a more versatile watch in that respect than the Rolex. The Rolex Oyster Bracelet is fairly plain, at least in the Explorer 2 iteration. As you can see, it's mostly of satin finish with the only polish being on the flanks, whereas the Grand Seiko bracelet is a little bit more stylish, at, at least in the sense that it gives you more to look at. A combination of staggered link alignment, staggered link size, and differential finish lights this up a little bit more than the Rolex, threading the needle between sports watch and dress watch aesthetics. It is quite impressive. You can see sizable links removed by screws. There's a half link mixed in on each side, and the clasp, unlike the Rolex, which is a lift lock, this is actually a trigger release system, so it's a little bit more compact, and the triggers ensure that this one will never pop open accidentally. Jumping to the case flank, you can see one of the key decision points when choosing between the Rolex and the Grand Seiko. The case shape itself is dramatically more complex than the rather slab-sided and squared-off Rolex Supercase. You can see that it's pretty much a vertical and a horizontal with the Rolex, whereas there are more transitional shapes and surfaces, as well as differential finish, both satin and polish, on the Grand Seiko. You'll also note the black polish known as Zeratsu tin plate finish. This is something Grand Seiko artisans execute manually by pressing the case directly against a tin milling plate. And you can see it's not just that it's optically smooth and mirror-like, it's the fact that it is remarkably complex in its contours and millimetrically identical from side to side. This is craft art at its best, and this is a hand-finished watch. The Rolex is principally machine manufactured. The bezel on this watch is uncharacteristically crisp for a pilot-style bezel. The click is sharp and distinct and loud. Most of the time with a GMT style bi-directional bezel, the click is indistinct. Sharp clicks tend to be the domain of dive watches. Not here. This feels as crisp as any Panerai Luminor submersible. You'll also note that there is a sort of green-gray metallic plate and a fully loomed bezel underneath a cambered sapphire cap, so it has the richness of something like a Blancpain 50 Fathoms, which uses that gorgeous domed sapphire over a bezel in its own right. So this is very much the 50 Fathoms aesthetic, but with different metallic tones and colors. The dial is really the heart and soul of this watch. As much as I want to say this watch is about the bezel or the spring drive, it's really about the dial. The dial here is a sensational burgundy sunburst metallic with a few well-chosen gold accents, silvered and hand-applied diamond-polished faceted indices for the hours. The dial furniture here is far superior in its detailing and finish than what you'll find on the Rolex with its relatively simple rounded and polished indices. There is a power reserve scale to trace the 72 hours of reserve de Marche, and you'll note that a few well-chosen yellow gold accents on the chapter ring outboard for the 24 hours, as well as the text of the dial, the 24-hour hand, and the counterweighted seconds, a colorful and character-rich dial. You can't see much of the movement. It's a spring drive. Uh, the spring drive Three-day power reserve, automatic winding caliber, 9R66, accuracy of plus or minus 15 seconds per month, stop seconds, dual time with 12 24-hour functionality, power reserve, and you can see the spring drive being governed by electromechanical impulse and a quartz oscillator, but powered by the spring energy of its mainspring barrel. You have that completely smooth sweep, unlike any Swiss lever escapement, unique to spring drive. You also get quartz precision with a watchmaker assembled, watchmaker tuned, and ultimately watchmaker serviceable movement inside this watch. It's the best of both.
both quartz precision and mechanical sole. And it's 200 meters water resistant. You can see the Grand Seiko Lion on a blasted base, all raised and relieved with high polish. A handsome case back, 200 meters water resistant. Now, Rolex, enter stage right. You know the Explorer too well. It bowed back at Baselworld 2000 and 11. It's been with us largely unmodified since, and there are two versions, black dial and white dial. I should mention that the black dial is a matte black, not the gloss black lacquer that you see on a lot of the other Rolex sports watches. You can see here, there's both a clamshell and a lift lock in the clasp, and the watch does wear wonderfully on the wrist, although it is larger. Let's get everything back in focus. Although it is a larger watch than the Grand Seiko, make no mistake, it fits slim and low on the wrist. Its only larger dimension is the lug to lug at 53.3 millimeters, but still, we're talking half a millimeter here. It's not a huge difference. I'll also mention that the watch is far thinner and easier to wear with a cuff, 12.4 versus 14.7. And if the timepiece is to be fit with an accessory strap, take note, 21 millimeters is the spacing. Maybe you'll find an Everest or a rubber bee that you dig, but I'll let you in on a secret. The Explorer 2 actually looks bitchin' on a NATO. It's one of the few Rolex watches that converts from the bracelet to a strap organically. So it's compact watch in almost every respect but link to link across the wrist. The bracelet is simple but solid. It's an oyster and it's an oyster with full satin finish. I would actually say that there is a better match between the spacing of the bracelet and the lugs on the Grand Seiko than there is on the Rolex. The Rolex case seems to overpower the end link of the bracelet. There's a disparity in width that I find a little disconcerting, but the quality of the bracelet is unarguable and the clasp is probably superior to what Grand Seiko offers. First you have the horn and beak lock system. You can hear that lock. You can't simply open it up. It's not friction fit. It'll stay locked even with the clamshell open. But with clamshell shut, now it's sure tight, truly secure. Open it up, take a look. Easy link. Five millimeters of in and out adjustment without a tool. It's the equivalent of adding or removing one sizable link. And look inside the clasp. There are three different anchoring points for the root of the bracelet. So you can do quite a bit of fine tuning with this bracelet by taking out links moving the station of the bracelet inside the clasp and deploying easy link. The case is simple but strong. It lacks the art and artistry of the Grand Seiko, there's no doubt, but it is lower in profile, both figuratively and literally. This is one of the rare Rolex watches that does not shout out for attention. Twin lock crown, screw down, 100 meters water resistant. This is a little bit of a throwback to the original 1971 Explorer 2 in that it features the combination of the orange arrow 24 hour hand and a fantastic radial finish emanating from an imaginary center point on the dial. So you can see that radial finish which is creating with a lapping machine at the factory. The dial is simple, no nonsense, and you can see that matte black rather than the gloss. The hours indices are large, white gold, and covered with Rolexes proprietary chromolite. We're going to get a loom shot of the two. Spoiler alert, the Grand Seiko takes it. But the Cyclops eye doesn't actually bother me here because with the larger dial on the 42 millimeter watch, it's able to breathe a little bit better. You don't feel like the dial is being overpowered by the magnifier. So you get the benefit of the magnifier, which is tremendous legibility, without any of the consequences to balance and aesthetics. Inside the case, Rolex manufactured caliber, 3187, only ever used in this reference. It features a larger date disc for the larger case and Rolex's proprietary Paraflex shock protection. Automatic winding, anti-magnetic hairspring, Paracrom blue, free sprung with a full bridge for shock resistance, the 48 hour power reserve, driving hands independently settable to display 12 and 24 hour time. This is a timepiece that is the apogee of refinement in mechanical watchmaking, guaranteed accurate to plus or minus two seconds a day or better per Rolex. It still can't touch spring drive, but as far as mechanical watches go, these things work miracles. Now, let's talk about the advantages of each one. First, we'll go with the Rolex. This is a timepiece that packs a five-year warranty versus three years for the Grand Seiko. Advantage Rolex. This is a watch that is slim in profile, and it's not close. 12.4 to 14.7. You can see the chunkiness of the Grand Seiko and the slim profile of the Rolex. Chunky, slim. Chunky, slim. It's the difference between a Girl Scout Thin Mint and a Samoa. So on the wrist, there is an elegance about the Rolex that the Grand Seiko can't match. 
I'll also mention that you have superior clasp flexibility with the independent adjustment of the Easy Link system and then the three different stationing points inside the clasp. You do get the feeling that you could do more to fine tune the fit of this watch than you can with Grand Seiko, and the double locking system offers greater security on the wrist. Also, a mechanical heartbeat. This is a Swiss lever escapement. It has a 28.8 beat rate. You hear it beating eight times a second against the ear. Spring drive is silent, and for some, there is no replacement for the heartbeat of a mechanical watch. I'll also mention that this is a potentially easier watch to service, whereas the Grand Seiko goes back to Japan to the hands of the folks who built it. This is a watch that, for most regional buyers in most major markets, can be serviced at a local Rolex service center, so it will be back to you far sooner than the Grand Seiko. Also worth mentioning, cachet, brand equity. I hate to talk about status and prestige, but it's a real thing in the luxury space, and for some, it will be a decision point. There's Rolex, Richard Mille, Patek Philippe, and precious little else in that upper echelon. The Grand Seiko has cachet among watch guys, but for the Gen Pop, it's still this. I'll also mention that the watch, objectively, does have a timeless quality to it. I referenced the original 1971 Explorer II when discussing this watch. Well, that speaks to the timeless factor in Rolex design, as well as the immunity to planned obsolescence. I don't necessarily know how this is going to age over nearly 50 years, but I can tell you that in 50 years, the Explorer 2 will still look recognizably like the watch I'm holding here. I'll also mention that there are two dial options, and it really does transform the watch. The black or Steve McQueen reissue, as this one's informally known, has a strong look to it, a historic look to it, whereas the white is glamorous exuberant, almost more of a warm weather or a summer watch, and affectionately known as the Polar Express, it has its own virtues, and it would be my choice among the two options. Ultimately, I would say that this is a watch that bucks the trend for Rolex, generally the epitome of conspicuous consumption, from its dominant satin finish to its low profile, its lack of a rotating bezel, and its under-the-radar status within the Rolex catalog. This is actually a Rolex that is a bit more discreet and modest about its status and about its stance on the wrist. I would even say compared to the Grand Seiko, which is a bewildering array of shapes and volumes and colors and textures, this is actually the low-profile choice of the two. Now, the Grand Seiko. Let's talk about some advantages, starting with the bezel. It performs three distinct functions. First, it looks the business. Second, it allows you to offset if you do set that 24-hour hand to GMT, you can use the local offset of a port or airport to find a third time zone. You can't do that with the stationary bezel of the Rolex. Also, important to note that with a sapphire cap, along with the sapphire over the dial, this watch is completely shielded from scratches and scuffs, which is nice because you have that hand-finished case. With the scratch-resistant sapphire on the bezel, you really have all aspect protection. Finally, if you want to consider this a non-life-saving piece of gear, you can sort of use it like a dive bezel, treating 6, 12, 18, and 24 as the quarters. You can actually use it as a light-duty timing reference. Unofficial, but it is one of the virtues of a rotating bezel. Now, superior dial design. The Rolex is timeless, but this is sensational. Let's get a little bit more light in there. You can see that burgundy sunburst, the gold accents, the splash of fading red on the power reserve scale. You can see the rich tones, everything between silver, black, and all of the reds and purples the mind can entertain and the eye can perceive, dancing around with that iridescent green-gray bezel surround. This is a colorful and enchanting watch. The Rolex seems almost drab by comparison, and the hand-finished dial furniture here with its faceting and its alternate satin and polish simply puts the Rolex back in the case. This is a masterclass, and Rolex should take a lesson. Now, other advantages. Three-day power reserve versus two-day in the Rolex. Spring drive, plus or minus 15 seconds a month versus perhaps 60 seconds or more per month with the Rolex. Quartz precision, mechanical sole. Also, power reserve scale, a handy complication that you'll often reference to ensure your watch will keep good time. And I'll also say there is a measure of flexibility here to fit a strap with both the strap tool aperture and a case that doesn't appear irrevocably wedded to that end link profile or this bracelet. It would look natural on a strap. The Rolex, not quite as much. Also, Loom, it's better on this watch. You're going to see why. 
I would say that the watch new priced $6,100 versus $8,200 for the Rolex offers an advantage if you purchase new on price and pre-owned. This is a watch that actually sells at or just above its retail on secondary markets, whereas the Rolex at $8,200 can be found for between seven and a half and eight thousand. So it actually loses a little bit. I'll also mention that this watch has rarity on its side: 600 pieces total from a brand that makes about 35,000 watches a year versus. For the Rolex, undoubtedly tens of thousands of Explorer 2s per year and a company that makes close to 800,000 watches total. So which one do I choose? My heart says Grand Seiko, but I have to tell you that if you were to throw the Polar Express dial on the Explorer 2 and make that the choice, I would go with the Rolex. It has an understatement, a stolid sobriety about it, and a workmanlike tool watch sensibility that actually appeals to me a little bit more than the Fantastico array of colors and textures on the Grand Seiko. I do love this watch, but if you were to give me the polar option, I would be going with the Rolex. And I actually thought I would be going with the Grand Seiko 15 minutes ago when I started this video. You guys let me know which one is your choice because I surprised myself here. Rolex versus Grand Seiko, loom shot to be. You can see the Grand Seiko with brighter loom and a fully loomed bezel has it all over the Rolex. The loom shot and the last licks go to Grand Seiko.